One of the overall sort of landscape issues with this is, you know, who, who remembers the title of the, of the book that profiles the Remax network and Dave and Gail starting it? What's that called? Everybody wins. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, normally we like to approach stuff from a win-win standpoint because most of our transactions really can be win-win. What is the one guaranteed outcome in a multiple offer situation? Someone is going to be a loser. <laughs> so, so one of the things that makes this situation different from a lot of what we deal with is guaranteed loser. So um, we're going to talk about that and how that can cause some, some specific concerns as well. So I'm going to start out with what the code says about this. So when representing a buyer, seller, landlord, tenant, or other client as an agent, realtors pledge themselves to protect and promote the interest of their clients. I'm going to read that again. Pledge and promote <coughs> to protect the, pledge themselves to protect and promote the interests of their clients. This obligation to the client is primary, but it does not relieve realtors of their obligation to treat all parties honestly. The word honestly is used very deliberately, and we'll talk briefly later on in the hour about how it is that the word honestly is used instead of words like fairly. It doesn't require fairness, just honesty. So that's from right out of Article 1 of the National Association of Realtors Code of Ethics. From Standard of Practice 1.6, which of course are the specific examples of how the code is to be, how the articles are to be applied, Realtors shall submit offers and counteroffers objectively and as quickly as possible. All right, so we're kind of laying the groundwork with those couple of excerpts. The National Association of Realtors has a thick um, ethics and arbitration manual. I mean, it's a very thick book, and it is the Bible for how it is that professional standards hearings are to be conducted and how it is that hearing panelists are to make their determinations. And coming right out of that um, ethics and arbitration manual are some comments specifically regarding multiple offer situations. Perhaps no situation routinely faced by realtors can be more frustrating, fraught with potential for misunderstanding and missed opportunity, and elusive of a formulaic solution than presenting and negotiating multiple purchase or lease offers and or counter offers on the same property. And Kimberly has often complained to me about how elusive this is of a formulaic solution. <laughs> All the time. Just thinking, I thought you probably wrote that. That was quoted right, right from a Kimberly Christman email. Kimberly Clark email. Um, continuing from the arbitration manual, consider the competing dynamics. Listing brokers are charged with helping the sellers get the highest price and the most favorable terms for their property. Buyers, brokers help their clients purchase the property at the lowest price and on the most favorable terms. Balance against the code's mandate of honesty is the imperative to refrain from making disclosures that may not in the final analysis be in a client's interest. Okay, so a little more groundwork here. So, the most common misconception that I see in the industry, both here locally but also in other places, is this sense that there is a one right way to handle multiple offers. And this is normally the most common misconception, that there's this, this idea that the one right way to handle it is you find yourself in a multiple offer situation if you're on the listing side, you notify everybody that there's multiple offers, you do not disclose the terms of any of the offers to any of the other offerors, you give everyone the opportunity to come back with their highest and best, and then you indicate you're going to pick the winner at the appointed time, right? I mean, that's an experience that we've probably all been through, and it's not necessarily the wrong way to do it, but it's definitely not the one right way to do it. While this may work some, or even most of the time, it can backfire, while you will have some offers, and this, this is sort of shifting as we go. You know, we, we've seen multiple offers start happening as early as the last year or two. I mean, 2012 is our first full year of recovery in the local market. So it's been happening a little more often as we continue moving along. Well, depending on where you are and where the given buyers are in a situation, you may have some that all respond to a notification that they're in a multiple offer situation with game on and they throw themselves at the property and the price gets bid up and the seller gets exactly what the seller wanted. However, you run the risk that you end up with offerers, one or worse yet, both slash all, who react by saying, I am not going to be the idiot who gets drawn into a bidding war in this market. Well, if you happen to have all of your offerers who react that way, you, you the listing agent, may have just gone from a multiple offer situation to a zero offer situation, and it could be your fault. So we're going to talk about that. 
So your one size uh, fits all situation could turn multiple offers into no offers. The your fault part is if you drove the process as opposed to letting your client drive the process. And in addition to squandering the sale, you could end up in front of an ethics hearing panel. We're going to discuss a few different ways you can end up in front of an ethics hearing panel. But in, in this instance, you could have an angry seller who files a complaint um, and drags you in front of an ethics hearing panel. We'll discuss later how it is that your colleagues can end up uh, with an ax to grind and drag you in front of an ethics hearing panel. The most important underlying principle, if you don't remember anything else that we discuss, is the client must be the driver of the process. We're the agent for the client, but the client has to be the driver. And that means a few different things. So you're still the expert. You're still going to be the person that's providing the advice and the input, but the client will be giving you the direction. So as I said, you can give even a suggested course of action. You just don't want to tell them what to do because it's not good enough to simply have the client on record saying it. You don't want the client to say later when it goes badly, but you said that was the way to go. You want to instead lay this out with pros and cons, risk, reward, because every single scenario that's out there is a possibly will have a, a, a corresponding downside to it. Be sure you lay it all out. The client makes the decision, and if it doesn't go the way you and or the client hope, at least you will have been on record having warned them it could go this way. This is as good as visual aids get when I'm doing this at 5 o'clock in the morning, but I was pretty excited that you get a visual aid, so I, I hope you'll join me in celebrating this exciting um, shot. Keep in mind it is a risk-reward continuum, so it's not a, it's this way or this way. You have this continuum, and you see on the low risk end, the very, very lowest risk way to treat an offer is to do what? Get out the pen and sign the stupid thing. I mean, that's the fastest way to go from offer to binding contract is just sign it. Don't do anything. Don't counter, don't haggle, don't let them know there's other offers, just sign it. That is the risk averse way to go. Now, the other thing, of course, that we're aware of is once it's signed, there's still some easy ways that buyers can bail out, but that's the most risk averse end of the spectrum. Obviously, if you're doing anything other than telling your seller or your seller choosing simply to sign it as written, it's because you're hoping that you're going to get what? Better, well, better terms. I mean, if the risk averse way, I mean, instant sale is sign, but most of us don't have sellers that do that because they want to hold out for at least somewhat better terms, either price, closing date, or some other variable. It's just you have to understand that there is truly this whole continuum where anything other than sign it as written incurs some risk. On the other extreme is, is attempting to choreograph an elaborate bidding war which entails significantly more risk, but obviously the possible reward that they're chasing is, oh, we might have a huge bidding war and the price gets bid up by thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars. So look carefully at this and make sure that when you lay out the scenarios for your client that you are talking in terms of, here are the reasons you may want to consider skipping the bidding war and, and skipping getting, trying to draw other people in and just sign it. Here are the reasons you may not want to sign it, but be aware if you go for this higher reward, you are taking on some additional risks. There's also this sort of middle ground that exists between both of those polar opposites. So you could do something like counter one of the offers without attempting to gin up the bidding war. So you're not taking it as written. That's the extreme risk averse position. But instead, you're going to go ahead and counter that, negotiate with them, but not necessarily bring in the other party and let them know that they're in a multiple offer situation. Any counter will still incur some risk, but it would be less risky than trying to orchestrate a bidding war if the bidding war were to fizzle. What not to do? So for sure, never, ever, ever respond to multiple offers by tendering a blanket counter offer to everybody who's interested because, of course, the downside is if more than one party says yes to what you've just offered, your sellers have just promised the same piece of real estate to multiple buyers and then there is a problem. You can of course do something similar to this that will be very very close to it which is do multiple counter offers in sequence so to one then the other so you would approach one at a time and if if you're able to get fast responses you're only setting aside so if you've got three offers A, B, and C setting aside B and C because A looks like the most promising if you from their initial offers had to pick which one you most want to work with A looks most promising you temporarily set aside B and C probably 
but not necessarily. Letting them know that they're being set aside. You normally don't want to let them know that. If it goes quickly enough and you go and decide, I need to ne negotiate with offerer B instead, if the process went quickly, offerer B will never know that they were set aside and that you're only talking to them because you thought offer A was the better one to work on and it didn't pan out. I mean, so depending on how transparent you are about the process, that of course could weaken your bargaining position. You know what, we got multiple offers, they're working with somebody else's right now. If you'll just sit tight, if you hear back, it's because it didn't go well. We have egg on our faces and our bargaining position isn't nearly as strong as it was a few minutes ago. You don't necessarily want to put yourself in that spot. Always be mindful of your obligation to present offers ASAP. Your clients can choose to sit on an offer. You do not get to make that choice. If you have an offer and you expect but do not yet have another offer, be very cautious about putting the one that you do have on the back burner. This is where our expertise in advising our clients becomes very important because if I'm, if I'm notified by somebody else that they're bringing another offer or that they expect that they will likely bring another offer, I am always going to communicate that to my seller. I sure don't want the seller to sign, have a second offer come in five minutes later and have them say, well, did you have any idea that was coming in? Well, yeah, I did. I didn't tell you about it. I mean, you need to make sure you keep the seller in the loop. But then again, we're the experts. We know how this works out. How many times have you gotten the call from another agent that an offer is forthcoming and then the offer is never forthcoming? There are a million reasons that happens. It, I mean, one of them is it's, it could legitimately be a bad agent. I mean, who just is clueless at reading their own clients. That happens. They're not lying. They just are too dumb to know that their client is not half as interested as they seem to think. Um, but it could also be that the client heads off in a different direction um, and gets distracted or a better property happened to come on the market at the last possible second. So we ne need to be able to explain to our sellers, yeah, I've been told another offer is coming. Based on a lot of experience, I would never tell you to set aside an offer that you actually have in front of you to work with. If it's a good faith offer and looks like it's something that is workable, I would never suggest that you should just set that aside, put it on the back burner in the hopes that something that we don't yet have is going to materialize. And if it does, that it's going to be better than the one that you already have on the table to work with. One of the reasons you don't want to back burner somebody is the offer and acceptance deadline, even if that first offer were to come in and the offer and acceptance deadline was two or three or four days out. And I will commonly do that on my offers, not because I'm expecting the seller to back burner us for three or four days, but because I'd rather do that and allow plenty of time for the last signatures to go on it after any negotiation than have to recirculate the contract all over again because the last set of initials went on after the offer and acceptance deadline. So make sure that your sellers understand, because I've had mine say it to me several times in the last few weeks. Oh, but it says here we don't have to respond until three days from now. That does not mean you should put them on the back burner and you would be very foolish to do so. Even though it says that, of course, if you irritate that buyer and they either think you're generally not negotiating in good faith or if they get the impression that you are deliberately gaming them by putting them on the back burner so that you can try to gin up some other offer, they can always pull the plug prematurely on that offer. They can always serve a withdrawal, a written notice of withdrawal of their offer and pull the plug even before the written offer and acceptance deadline has rolled around. Everyone got that? It's easily forgotten because you're getting a piece of paper that says on its face that this is going to be valid for X number of days. Well, only until they change their minds. One of the things that puzzles me is, you know, most of us are pretty good at predicting when we're showing a property, this is one that if it doesn't have any other offers on it already, it isn't going to last long. There will be other offers. If you like it, you're going to have to move quickly and there will be other offers. And it's interesting because <clears throat> you'll then have the buyer that goes in and figures, well, you've checked, they've said there are no other offers right now, and so I'm going to go in on a property that was clearly priced to sell at 100% of list price, and I'm going to go in 10,000 below. And I'm going to try to work them over. Well, you want to be on record on the buyer side of that. If you think this is a situation that is very likely going to turn into a multiple offer situation, make sure you let the buyer know preemptively they should probably treat it as a multiple offer situation because as I say up here, there is the risk that if they started out 10 grand below and a second offer does come in, they're not entitled to necessarily hear about it. If that seller looks at that initial offer, and I had this happen two weekends ago, seller looks at that initial offer and says, that's so low that I'm not 
I mean, I'm not, there's no sense of urgency on my part. I'm not at all optimistic about it. In the meantime, a second offer comes in and the second offer was so much better that the seller directed me not to even let the first offerer know that we got a second offer. So that first offerer went from making an offer to most of a day elapsing to finding out late that night, we're sorry, we've already sold it to someone else. Done deal. You lose. Tell your buyers that they're not entitled to an update and if it's one that's going to generate multiple offers, make sure you do your best to educate them to the risks of coming in on a property that, that objectively deserves to be selling at list price. Make sure they know just because you're the only offer right this minute doesn't mean that you couldn't lose it and, and never hear a word about it that another offer has been received. Everyone got that? And we'll talk about your obligation to disclose offers in a minute. Fair play considerations, these are not binding. Remember, I talked about how the code of ethics requires that we treat all parties honestly, but not necessarily fairly. And the reason is, it's not that the code uh, wants us to be unfair. It is that fairness is such a subjective sort of an issue. So while none of this is binding, it's something you should be mindful of. There will be situations like the one I just sort of described. One offer came in that was so not encouraging to the sellers that when one came in that was so much better, it was, there was no contest. Clearly, that's the one we want to work with. We are not gonna, we're not going to even breathe the word about it to the first folks. There is a specific reason for that. But in many situations, you will want to be mindful of fair play considerations. And by that, I mean you put yourself in the shoes of one of those parties on the other side of the table and think, Am I treating them in a way that would leave them with a sense that they were being treated fairly and equally as long as there was no compelling reason to do otherwise? And so in this instance, the most common example, be mindful of informational consistency across multiple offers. For example, if the second offerer in the door knew there was a competing first offer, okay, and this is a very common scenario. So you've already got an offer on the table. Agent calls and says, I got people that want to bring an offer. Do you have any offers? Yes, I do. Well, that agent then that brought the second offer had the benefit of knowing it was a competitive offer situation from the moment they wrote the offer. But the first agent didn't know that because at the time, the first agent wasn't in a multiple offer situation. So there may be cases like the one I described where you wouldn't tell that first agent. But unless there's a specific reason not to, don't forget to sort of evaluate it from the sense of what would violate a sense of fair play. If I were that first agent and I brought a good faith offer and it wasn't far off the mark, and I would have likely been willing to my client to bump it up if I had known that it was a competitive bid situation. Would I feel like you hosed me by not giving me that courtesy and that opportunity? So again, none of this is binding. You're obligated to follow the direction of your client, but be mindful of what's going to feel fair versus unfair if you were on the other side of the table. The code of ethics does not expressly mandate fairness, and this is right out of the manual, given its inherent subjectivity. Remember that the preamble has long noted that realtor has come to connote competency, fairness, and high integrity. If a seller directs you to advise offerers about the existence of other purchase offers, fairness dictates that all offerers or their representatives be so informed. Okay, so that's conditional, that's an if. If your sellers give you the green light to inform somebody else, of the existence of another offer, then everybody else that is similarly situated should be informed. Must you disclose the existence of other offers? Nope. So the answer comes right out of standard of practice 1-15. Realtors in response to inquiries from buyers or cooperating brokers shall, with seller's approval, disclose the existence of offers on the property. Where disclosure is authorized, Realtors shall also disclose, if asked, whether the offers were obtained by the listing agent, another licensee in that same firm, or by a cooperating broker outside the firm. Okay, so this is, this is all very conditional. So you got this A, B. If the sellers have given you the green light for A, which is disclose the existence of the offer, then B applies. If you're gonna disclose, then upon request, if that other agent says, well then tell me, now that you're informing me of the other offer, that there is another offer. Tell me, is that your offer? Is that an offer of a colleague in your firm or is that an offer from some cooperating broker outside your firm? So if A is a yes, yes, your seller has directed you to disclose, then B is an absolutely you must. It's not a go back to the seller and say, can I disclose where it's come, 
has come from. It is a you must disclose, at least in that level. So it's, it, this is kind of a confusing standard of practice because you've got the shall, broker shall, except then it goes on to make it conditional with the seller's approval. Okay, so that makes it kind of tricky, but don't forget it's always going to be with the seller's approval, which also means, let's flip that around. If you were going to elect to withhold information about the existence of another offer, you only would withhold that information because seller. the seller told you to. Okay? Um, so, cover your rear end. Is there any chance your strategic choice not to disclose the existence of another offer could be viewed later by another agent as self-serving to you and not obviously in the best interest of your seller? If the answer is yes, you want a paper trail. Now, I, I use several very deliberate words. Strategic choice. You have the right not to disclose the existence of another offer to another agent if it's at your seller's direction. But if you're programming the seller to say that, or if the other agent is likely to look at it and say, eh, I don't trust him, I don't trust her, that agent did that, that agent was driving the process and they did it because they had the other offer. They did it because there was a double ender, they did it because they don't like me and it was their buddy from within their office, any of those things. So if any of that is likely to, and I'm not saying that, that you were doing anything wrong, but if any of those scenarios are likely to enter the mind of that other agent, you want to have a paper trail. Get your seller when you're going through this process to send you a quick email so when you're asked later, you have something to point to where the seller is on record saying, I am confirming I don't want you to notify that other agent of this offer or not at this time. It only takes a minute with email and your clients can often hammer that out over the phone. But when you're having these conversations either in person or by phone, get in the habit of concluding your conversation with, as soon as we hang up, I need you to send me a very quick message. You want it to be just the one or two sentences. I don't want, you don't want to have to disclose an email that's got a whole bunch of other potentially confidential information about the negotiations. You want it to be a single subject email, but get in the habit of saying, as soon as we hang up, please drop me a quick email that just says, per our conversation, I direct you not to disclose the existence of this offer to that agent. This comes up actually pretty frequently. So the scenario, offer is received and negotiated. Not a multiple offer situation, an offer. It's received and negotiated. The parties reach a meeting of the minds. Congratulations are exchanged. Hey, congratulations, Marianne. Your clients just bought themselves a house, I tell you. The contract gets revised. Marianne gets the initials from her, from, uh, her clients on the final revisions to the contract. Marianne diligently and timely sends that revised contract with her client's initials back to me, which I then promptly pass along to my sellers and five minutes before the sellers were at a spot where they could sign it, another offer arrives, and now we have a problem. So as we discussed earlier, no ifs, ands, or buts. You have no discretion on this. You must, must, must alert the sellers to the additional offer immediately. Okay? You may feel like you're betraying the agent whom you just told you had a deal, but that doesn't relieve you of your duties to the client. I will not like the fact that Mary Ann will hate me. I really will, as, as insensitive as many of you believe that I am, I will feel bad about that. <laughs> However, I will have an absolute obligation to let that seller know. So all previous considerations that we've discussed apply regarding whether to disclose to the first offerer. So not only, not only do I have an absolute obligation to present this to my seller and to crack this whole thing wide open again because legally, Technically, it's not a done deal until the pen hits the paper, but we could even find ourselves in a situation where the sellers just concluded a five-day negotiate marathon negotiation with Marianne's clients, and Marianne's clients were totally working my people over, and they were exhausted, and they'd come down quite a bit more on price than they had ever imagined, and that second offer came in so much higher that they decided they didn't even want to let Marianne know it was such a, it was such a vast improvement, they were just going to sign it as written. So not only could Mary Ann be surprised that another offer was in play when she thought she had a done deal, it's possible if your sellers have so directed that Mary Ann would never even know it until the house was actually under contract to somebody else, the existence of whom she had never even heard of. That is a tricky situation because you end up in a spot where I may never have to see my seller again, especially if I'm moving them out of the area. There's a really good chance I'm never going to see them again. I will see Marianne again. 
and I will not like having Marianne hate me for a short period of time, and I really won't like it if she holds a grudge over a long period of time. This really interpersonally for residential realtors in particular, because we tend to be much more personality driven, this is a very, very difficult situation to find yourselves in. So two things, you need to make sure if you're on the listing side that you, that you are mindful of the, you must, you have certain duties, you, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, there's no discretion, you must let them know. And obviously if you're on the side where you were the loser, or you represent the clients who turn to the losers, you got to really swallow hard and not take it personally and recognize if the, if the roles are reversed, you would have had the very, very, very same obligations. But because you know you're going to have somebody who's really ticked off, there was a chance of the other person being ticked off when they were the loser in these other scenarios, you're pretty well guaranteed to have somebody seriously ticked off. Once again, the same considerations apply regarding having a paper trail so you can prove I wasn't wanting to keep this a secret from you. It wasn't a plot led by Matt DeFanis the seller wanted it that way, okay? Think defensively, we talked about this kind of all the way through. Multiple offer situations guarantee at least one loser, therefore someone will likely be disappointed, angry, and or suspect that you did something evil. Be mindful of how you can head off or at least defend against accusations of wrongdoing. Heading off are always, always better. Next best thing is if you can't head it off and somebody drags you into a hearing anyway, be ready to defend against it and documentation like the emails are so, so valuable. If the losing agent is angry and believes whether it's true or not that you acted unethically, you will find yourself in a hearing. And even if you are successful in your defense, you're a serious loser for having been dragged through the process. Also remember, Bill Craig will be an innocent victim in, in this as well. When navigating multiple offers, assume someone's gonna be angry. Ask yourself what documents or email correspondence would enable Bill Craig to offer an ironclad defense of my actions when some other managing broker gets him on the phone to complain that I am the epicenter of all evil in the universe. But that goes to how to head it off. We very, very rarely find ourselves on the receiving end of a formal written ethics complaint and the hearing notification. That is very, very uncommon. Before that would happen, that, that almost never just lands out of the clear blue sky. Before that would happen, Bill Craig gets a phone call from some other firm's managing broker to talk about why it is that Chris Johnson had to screw over their agent and why she has to be so evil all the time. So, but, but that's the way the phone call goes. And, so, and of course, Bill and any of us who have dealt with conflict resolution always knows that, well, first of all, Chris isn't generally in the habit of doing that. And secondly, even if we thought Chris was capable of it on some level, we wouldn't assume that she had in this case anyway. But there's nothing more valuable than when Bill tries to diffuse that and, and gently put that other managing broker on hold. Let me check into this and I'll get right back to you. And the very, very, very best situation is to be able to have access to, here's the, here's the handful of email messages that lay out without any doubt the seller directed it. It wasn't that Chris was being evil. We, we get that your agent and that agent's client lost out. Chris is following directions and stayed 100% within the bounds of the code of ethics. All right, so quick review. Most underlying everything we talked about today, who drives the process? Sorry. Yeah, sing, single biggest thing to have a takeaway on here. Um, multiple offer situations guarantees that somebody is going to be A. That's right. Even if you are 100% right and vindicated in the course of an ethics hearing or uh, legal action, if you get dragged into it, you are a loser. That's right. And you can keep yourself and Bill Craig out of real estate prison by keeping what kind of a trail? Paper. That's right. Paper or electronic if it's archived very well. Yeah, and no one right way is the other big thing. So you always need to make sure, your, and make sure your sellers know there's no one right way so that they don't get trapped in a situation that backfires. Great conversation, guys. Thanks. Thanks for suggesting it, Russ. That worked out well.